In the video on section 8.1, the population mean was 5.2 for all of the marbles. And the 8.1 video noted that if samples are taken from that population, the sample means will distribute normally with a spread that is related to the standard error of the mean, rounded off here to point 0.2. That means that if I were, for example, to go up and down about two of these standard errors, um, I would have about 95% of the sample means within that range from 4.8 to 5.6. You can see that 95% just below. It's not exactly 95%, and there is an adjustment that has to be made for the sample size, which we will do later in this video. But between 4.8 and 5.6 should be 95% of the sample means uh, that would be randomly pulled from it. Or put another way, there's a 95% probability that sample means will land between 4.8 and 5.6. The reality, however, is that we don't know the population mean. That's what we're trying to determine from a single sample. Say, for example, a sample with a mean of 5.4. That's rounding off that first sample. Well, that sample had a uh, standard error of the mean of 0.18, rounded off, as I said, to 0.2. I'm using that in this example. So I could slide the curve, if you will, to the right by 0.2, the red curve over to the purple curve, and then I could go left and right that same amount. And I would have a range that runs from 5 to 5.8. That area under the curve is the probability. But in this case, I'm centered on the sample mean. That purple area represents roughly a 95% probability that the population mean will have been captured between 5 and 5.8. Between what we'll call the lower bound for the 95% confidence interval and the upper bound for the 95% confidence interval. Now in this section we're looking at 95% confidence intervals. That's sort of an industry standard, if you will. Uh, but you can do other levels of confidence. But 95% is a standardly used confidence interval in many forms of research. But it may depend on your field exactly what value is used. So we can't construct the red curve because we don't know the actual population mean. But I can use the sample mean and a standard error of the mean based on that data, which is a standard deviation divided by the square root of n, go left and right, and generate a interval in which I expect to find the population mean. In this case, you can see the population mean is within that area. If I keep doing this, about 95% of the time, I will successfully capture population means in these intervals that I build. In the next section, I'll go through the mechanics of actually constructing these intervals and adjust for some of the issues such as our small sample size. Here I've taken the previous example which borrowed on sample 1. That has a sample size of 5. It has a sample mean of 5.38 which I had rounded to 5.4. It has a sample standard deviation of 0.4, and it has a standard of the mean of 0.18, which I rounded to 0.2. But the mechanics are the same as in the first section of this video. The new feature is how many standard errors to go left and right. And we have a formula that will calculate how many standard errors to go left and right. The formula is a new function called the T inverse function. It can be seen here in this box, T-I-N-V. It can also be seen down here at the bottom. 
t equals inv comma 1 minus 0 0.95 the 0 0.95 is our 95 percent level of confidence this will put 95 percent of the area under the curve symmetrically distributed on either side of the sample mean don't forget it's 1 minus the level of confidence I refer to the level of confidence as C. You'll see that Google Sheets refers to it as the probability. The level of confidence is the probability. The second part is N minus 1. N minus 1 is called in statistics the degrees of freedom. N is just the sample size. So this is going to be 5 minus 1. It's using the cell K13. You can see the cell K13, sorry. Here, take that back out, uh, up here at K13 is 5. That's the sample size. So this is the formula for the T-critical. That's what this is called. This thing is called T-critical, and it's how far left and right to go. So then all I do is I take the mean. Uh, you can see that in, in these cells here. You take the mean, and you subtract T-critical times the standard error, and that will take you to the left, 2.776 standard errors. And this is the mean plus, the formulas there. This spreadsheet will be linked below if you want to go on and look at these formulas in more detail. This is the mean plus the t-critical times the standard error, as detailed here. The result is that the left bound is actually at 4.87, and the right bound is actually at 5.89. Uh, these are slightly different than the first video in the first section because I rounded the values to make that easier to demonstrate the principle of what we're doing. What I've done is said that between 4.87 and 5.89, I have a 95% probability that I will find that the population mean will occur within that range of the 5.38 sample mean. Indeed, the range does include uh, 4.87, if you put a 4.87 on the right of a number line, and you put a 5.89 on the left, you will indeed find that 5.2 does occur between them. It is inside the 95% confidence interval. When we actually construct these, since all we have is the sample mean, the 5.38, being calculated there, it's being calculated in those first five values. Uh, because we only have that sample mean, we never really know what the true population mean is. All we'll be able to say is that the population mean uh, is between 4.87 and 5.89, and that there is a 95% probability of that event. The subtlety is that on any one test that we may run, uh, bearing in mind that we don't know the actual population mean when we do any of these, on any test that we may run, we do not know whether or not we've captured the population mean. Uh, while I can say I'm 95% confident the population mean is between 4.87 and 5.89, what this really means is if I do this test many hundreds of times, 95% of the time I will correctly capture the population mean within that range. There will be, over the long run, about 5% of the times where I fail to capture the population mean from my sample. My sample mean will simply be too unusually far away from the population mean to capture it. But this does give us a way of estimating where the population mean could be. And that's often good enough to take action. So in an early example on vitamin A deficiency in children, we can get a 95% confidence level for, say, the vitamin A precursors present uh, uh, in, the, in a test. And from that, decide whether or not an inter a vitamin A campaign intervention is warranted or needed or necessary. In general, uh, today, many people know to uh, eat local foods that are actually high in vitamin A and prevent vitamin A deficiency in, in children. 
Well, that's how you can you construct a 95% confidence interval. This is the 95% confidence interval. You'll need the sample size, sample mean, sample standard deviation. You'll have to calculate the standard error, T critical. We use 0.95 in this course for a confidence level. But if you were told to use a different confidence level, you change the C to a different value. You can see that function being used here. And M minus 1, the degrees of freedom, uh, where N is just a sample size. And that tells you how many standard errors you need to go left and right. And the result is a 95% confidence interval as seen here and here as well. With this, should be able to do homework in which, given a sample, you can construct a 95% confidence interval for the possible population mean from that sample.